Hello, my name is Tomer. I have a PhD in electrochemistry and over 10 years of experience in developing electrochemical sensors, fabricating, patenting, and commercialization of electrochemical flow systems and microfluidic devices. In the next slides, I'm going to try to give you the basics, what I call the A to Z of electrochemical flow systems. Everything you need to know in order to get into this topic or if you want to improve some specific skills. Let's start. So this is a basic example of a microfluidic system. You have your pump, which is the driving force which takes water from the reservoir and push it towards the chemical cell. The chemical cells in our case is the coffee pod, where the coffee is extracted into the liquid. From there, it moves on to, into the cup and towards the detector, the person that is actually drinking the coffee and deciding if it's good or bad. If we look at the definition of an uh, electrochemical flow system, or flow cell, it's a device for which fluid may be driven using an external force, again, usually a pump, often rectangular or tubular form for electrochemical application. So we can see that we have two main components. We have the pump and we have the flow cell. We're gonna discuss each one in the next slides. So a lot of people are actually asking, why do I wanna use flow systems? Because once you design a flow system, you're adding more layers of complexity to your, your original system and you're making your life harder at the beginning. So flow systems, especially in electrochemistry, have a, many, have a lot of advantages. The first thing is when we're doing an electrochemical process, we're measuring only the species that are in or entering our diffusion layer. When we add flow to our system, we're actually compressing the diffusion layer. We have forced convection. So the amount of species in the diffusion layer, which be, will be much higher. So we'll have a stronger analytical signal and we can increase our signal to noise ratio. Or for an analytical point of view, in a regular electrochemical setup, we can only go down until a certain concentration where we cannot detect anymore. Once we compress the diffusion layer and we add more species to the diffusion layer and getting a stronger signal, we can actually improve our detection limit. Another thing is the ability to automate our system. Sure, it's very hard at the beginning and it will make your life harder, but once your system is fully automated, you can decrease tremendously the amount of human error in the measurements and you can add actually accuracy and precision to your system. A lot of people are usually, usually measuring a, a small volumes. For example, in a biological measurements, when you have a limited amount of blood for your measurement. If you're gonna measure in a droplet, and people are doing that, at a certain point, uh, the drop will start to evaporate. So you'll have changes in the concentration and you'll have maybe a noise in your measurement. You can see on the right, and I'll take a pen here, you can see here, that you can design a system that uses very low amount of volume. Here you can see the reservoir is 50 microliter and the measuring chamber is only seven microliter. Uh, and you can get the same performance. And over here you can see your electrodes, over here you can see your reagents, and of course this is the measuring, measuring chamber. Very, very low volumes, and you can uh, still get, you can reduce the amount, the sample volume, and you, you, at the same time, you can increase the accuracy and precision. Now, unlike a regular measurement, if you need to make a calibration curve, so you'll have to take one of those droplets and start measuring different concentrations. So you'll add to have at least three to five measurements to have your calibration curve, and then you have to measure the sample. And again, if the temperature changes or everything, everything is very hard, and you can add the human error in every stage. But this is a protocol for an automated uh, process. So you take 100 microliter of A, 300 microliter of B, you mix them, you perform your measurement, you clean the system, you send it to waste, and you repeat. Now, once you have one of those protocols, and you can change the amount that you take from A to B, so you'll have your different concentrations for the calibration per curve. Once you have one of those protocols, you can just write five or six uh, commands like this and tell the system perform a uh, calib a perform calib b perform calib c and the system will run all those calibration curves or all those calibration measurements and you'll have your calibration curve and you don't have to touch anything so again this will increase your accuracy and precision another huge advantage of uh, microfluidics is the ability for online monitoring 
So we need to monitor a lot of things in our life. So here on the left, you can see someone is measuring the pH or a salinity of a pool or a water reservoir. In the middle here, a person is measuring the pH of wine and the same thing here, uh, a pH of aquarium. All these measurements are extremely important. If you have a change in the pH, your wine will be bad, your fish will die, a, a change in the salinity, or if you're measuring heavy metals, then your water is no longer drinkable or swimmable, depending where the water are. And the problem is that usually people do sampling, just like in these pictures. People will go to the place or will take a sample, perform a measurement, analyze the results, and then report. Now, what happens if, if in this case, in the, you're measuring heavy metals in water? I used to live in Montreal, so we used to have a lead problem in water. Let's say you're measuring lead in water. You found out that there's actually, the lead concentration is above one PPP and it's no longer drinkable. Then you have to send an advisory to everyone not to drink the water. It may have took you a few hours from the moment that you went and sampled the place that, with the com contamination until you actually analyze the result, until you send a note. So those are a few hours that people were exposed to lead in water. And when you open your tap water, you want your water to be good. Now you have no idea if someone measured the quality of the water now, a week ago, I also used to live in Israel. In Israel, some of the water wells are being measured once a month. So if there's any contamination, you're only going to know about it like 30 days in delay. And in Montreal, a lot of time they used to give us advisory to boil the water because there is some uh, biological contamination. So all of these, you get the, the notice in delay. And between the measurement and the notice, the, all that time you're exposed. If you add a small sensor here, right? Open, each time you open the water, that's like your pump that pushes the water. And you have your measurement here and you can have a small LED light that blinks green or red. And as long as it's green, the water is good. The moment it's, the water are bad, it will blink in red and you automatically know that the water is bad and you should not drink it. So you have an online monitoring that gives you a on-demand precise uh, notifications. That's another advantage. And now we're gonna move to another huge advantage. That's the remote sensing. Now, remote sensing is the ability to acquire information about an object or phenomena without physically contacting the object or the place for which the information is obtained. And here you can see an example from 1978. That's the first uh, online monitor that people, uh, sorry, remote uh, sensing method that people used. Basically, they had a boat that traveled the Bay of San Francisco and they measured the concentration, I think it was cadmium and arsenic in different location. And after a few months, they had a, a precise map of the concentrations of those metals in different areas. And here you can see here, you can see their system. The system is very simple. They had a few pumps that will actually push the water or draw the water from their, uh, the ocean to their measuring cell. Here, those are they're basically the place where they actually perform the measurements and they had the result and they went to the lab and uh, analyzed it. That's old school. The problem is that they didn't have Wi-Fi and a lot of the things that are available to us today. So they had to wait from the moment they performed the measurement until they actually uh, got the result. Today, remote sensing is very uh, uh, developed. So if you look at here in the top on A, all the dots, the red dots, represent places that I will actually put a sensor for remote sensing. So let's say I want to measure the quality of water here. I don't want to drive here or sail here every day or every few days to perform a measurement. I can just place a buoy just like here that will measure the concentration of the water here and will send it to me through Wi-Fi or other method directly to me. So I'll know every second what is the quality of the water here or in terms of heavy metals, uh, biological contamination, whatever is important to me. Also, you can see that this is a entering point or exit, and this is another point that may be important to me. So I can again place a buoy or I can actually place a, a stationary a, a sensor on the land that actually gets the water. And I saw an example for that uh, in, uh, I think it was Sweden on one of the Scandinavian, that a person placed a sensor that used 
the flow of the river as a pump to measure uh, contamination of heavy metals. Now, those stationary sensors are really nice, but what if I want something more mobile? So during my PhD, I was involved in the Hydronet project where we developed this autonomous uh, robotic fleet that will sail in river and lagoons. That was a huge EU project. We had partners from Slovenia, Italy, uh, Swiss, uh, Russian, Israel. It was a huge project. And the idea is that if we have one of those robots that will sail uh, uh, a lagoon or river, it can give you a online monitoring of different aspects. We were in charge of the cadmium, arsenic, and uh, uh, mercury measurement. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, and there were another partners that were the Russian partner, for example, measure oil spills on the water with the, the camera that you can see here. Uh, sorry, they had a camera here that is not in the picture. This is what I circle is actually the antenna. Uh, and the idea is that if you have a contamination you can actually follow the contamination to its origin and if it's a factory you can actually find it or tell it that is responsible of cleaning the water so you can use it as a regulatory tool on the right here this a uh, yellow fish that's a product it's called the shawl project in england and they developed this uh, fish like robot they and they developed as a fish so it won't scare the local fish community and they measure different uh, contamination in harbors now, the first prototype was actually black and a lot of people ended up fishing it or destroying it. So they made it the uh, bright yellow. So it will be more recognized and uh, more protected. So this is an example of remote sensing and it's like huge uh, abilities. And I do believe that this is the future of uh, microfluidics. So if we'll have a quick summary of the things we talked about so far, why do we need to use uh, uh, electrochemical flow systems? So they increase the mass transport, so they give us better signal and better signal to noise ratio. You can reduce the sample volume. So if you're using expensive uh, samples, you don't need to use all of it. Uh, they will increase the accuracy and precision. They will also decrease the human error, and that's if you automate it. And they, you have the ability to use it as a remote sensor or online monitoring, and again, this thing is a big issue. This is the, the future. All the water companies, they want to have some online monitoring. All, all the uh, process that you have in the industry, they have to have some online monitoring to make sure that everything is correct. So electrochemistry can play a big role in that. So let's move in, uh, to the next stage. I told you that we have two main components. It's the pump and the electrochemical cells. So the pumps. I divided it into two different types of pumps. On the right here, uh, you have uh, what you call the turbo pumps or a very delicate pumps. They are usually, if you're using very, very small volumes, so if your volume is in the microliters, you want to have a very accurate and a very precise pump. So you're going to use one of those. The problem with one of those is that if you get some sort of contamination or some salt is deposited here on the blades, then the pump is destroyed really fast. And trust me, I did destroy one of them because I had some salty water spill on it. So they're very accurate, but they're also very expensive. But if you're using small volumes, you have to use those. If you're using larger volume, then you can use one of these pumps. On the top, you have a syringe pump. A syringe pump basically pushes the a syringe either f uh, forward or backwards, draws uh, the liquid, and the, just like the turbo pumps, you can also program them. Uh, some of them are programmable. Uh, the one here, the picture, I, I once bought one of those for around $100, so they're not that expensive. And some of them actually have the ability to have several syringes, so you can actually have several different types of liquids. Uh, and again, very simple, very easy to use. I will actually start with one of those if I needed to. And you have a prosthetic pump, uh, also programmable, also for larger uh, volumes. Now, the disadvantage of uh, these pumps, these two pumps, is that they have a stepper motor that actually increases the noise in your measurements. So if you're using uh, UMEs, ultramicroelectrodes, a lot of times, if you don't uh, cover your uh, pump, either put it outside the Faraday cage or make a small Faraday cage for, uh, for the pump, I just wrapped it with the copper mesh, 
you can also use uh, stainless steel mesh if you have it. So if you wrap it, it will uh, reduce the noise, the, the electric noise that the pump is making, but otherwise it will add noise. Uh, and it also have the mechanical noise of the stepper motor, something that I did not see with uh, these two pumps. Uh, now, when you're using the pump, uh, you have two different types of methods. You have the flow injection analysis and sequential injection analysis. Now, flow injection analysis is basically HPLC. The pump is positioned, here you see here, the pump is positioned before the carrier liquid. It pushes the carrier liquid to the, the sample injection. Remember in HPLC you have the uh, sampling loop, right? So it, you're ha you'll add your sample here. The pump will push it, the, it'll push your uh, buffer solution through the sample and towards the reactor. In HPLC, it's a column, uh, and from the reactor to the detector. In electrochemical uh, measurements, basically the reactor and the detector are uh, combined, right? The other option is sequential injection analysis. Here, the pump is positioned between the carrier and your manifold or valve selector, and the pump will actually draw the carrier and then push it through the valve selector. You can choose if you want to uh, draw a sample or reagent and to your tubes and from here it will actually push it through the actor and the detector and again in electrochemistry both of them are combined so those are the two methods that you need to consider uh, what's better suited for you uh, I like SIA uh, sequential injection analysis because it gives you much more flexibility and you can actually add uh, much more reagents and samples and you can play with the system more but if you have a very, very simple system, this can actually also work. And I'll actually show you a, some of my work where I'm actually using a, a flow injection analysis because I didn't need a complex system. And I wanted to show you a, a sequential injection analysis protocol that uh, I used a, in actually in the HydroNet project just to show you the way you need to think if you're using sequential injection analysis. I told you. It's, it gives you more flexibility, but it also adds more com complex to, complexity to your system. But let's look at the different process and how you need to look at the system. So the first, and sorry, and here are the commands that I'm performing and you'll actually see it in the, in the drawing. So the first command is to clean the cell and measure the blank. So I'm actually using the pump to pull a buffer solution and push it through the measuring cell. Uh, while performing a measurement and everything is actually going to waste, right? So that's the first uh, thing that I did. The second thing I did, I wanted to measure a sample. So what I did is you draw the sample and again, when you're using this type of measurement, when I'm saying pulling and drawing, you need to think about that you have a lot of tubes. So I'm drawing the sample, I'm actually storing it into the tubes uh, be between the pump, this is very simplified, but the tube was longer. And then the second thing that I'm going to do is the liquid that is now in the tube is being pushed, and I'm using the buffer solution for that, is being pushed towards a mixing cell. So it used to be in the tube and now it's in the mixing cell. Now, when you're doing these types of, types of measurements, and I use the turbo pump, you also need to measure uh, if the pump uh, has the same amount of volume pushing and pulling. Because sometimes it, the pump will have a small difference. It could be a microliter or less, but it might be crucial for you. So you actually need to measure the amount of uh, volume that is being pushed by the pump. Let's say you tell it push 100 microliter. You actually need to measure that it is indeed 100 microliter. And it, this is very easy to do. You can just weigh the liquid, right? You use water. You, you have uh, uh, something that you know that you're told the weight that this is zero and then you add the liquid into it and then you weigh it and you know. And you also need to make sure that when it draws liquid from that cup, that it, it, it also draw the amount that you, you told it. And if not, you need to adjust your software. So let's go back to this example. So now I have in the mixing chamber uh, my sample but I want to make a standard edition uh, measurement. So I need to add a standard to my solution. So now I'll draw a standard to the pipe and push it into the mixing chamber. And lastly, I want to control the pH or ionic strength. So I'm going to add a buffer to that uh, mixing chamber. Now, I need to have everything uh, well mixed and we will talk about the mixing strategies uh, in a few slides, but 
what I, I, I did is basically I did like a pipette uh, method. I pulled and pushed and pulled and pushed uh, the liquid to the mixing chamber a few times until it was well mixed. Now that the li liquid is well mixed, I'm going to pull it from the mixing chamber and I'm going to push it towards the measuring cell, performing a measurement and everything else goes to the waste. Now, I still have some liquid at the end of the measurement in my measuring cell. I want to make sure my measuring cell is clean. So I can either uh, push more buffer solution and clean it, or what I did is I, sorry, after the measurement, is I actually pulled all the liquid from the measuring cell, making sure it's empty, and then pushed it directly into the waste. And again, if you have a manifold, you can, you, you have a, a lot of connections. You can, I, in this case, I have two connections to the waste from the cell directly, and I had another option on my manifold. So this is an example, and again, it looks like hard work, uh, but after I finished this protocol, I had a protocol that I can always use. The only thing I needed to change is the amount I, I'm taking from uh, my sample or from my standard. And I can repeat that measurement many times. And what I did is basically press play. I had all, uh, I had like a, a bunch of protocols to tell the system what to do. I made sure I had enough uh, liquids. I went to have lunch or do something else, whatever I needed to do. do. And I came back later and I had uh, all the files saved with all the results and I can just do the data processing, but I didn't have to be there for the experiment itself. So I didn't, I could not damage the experiment. Uh, we will talk about, about problems in the experiment, but if everything is uh, working well, then you're saving time and you're decreasing error. So, Another thing that you need to consider between a flow injection and sequential injection is that the profile of your liquid in the tubes are also different. And this is important for people that are actually doing a simulation or if you did a simulation and it doesn't align very well with the, your data and you're trying to understand what happened. So in flow injection analysis, we're just pushing the liquid forward, right? So the liquid will have this uh, parabolic shape. You, sorry, you'll have a, a head, a tail and the place where the majority of the concentration is. Usually it will look actually more like this, right? Uh, now, if you're doing sequential ejector analysis, you're actually pulling the liquid and then you're pushing the liquid, right? So your profile is quite different. Still in the middle, you have the majority, but still your profile is different. And that's something that you need to consider if you're doing simulations or if something is off and you want to understand what actually happens. So you need to know what happens in your system. Now, mixing strategies. So here on the top, this is the strategy I used, just pulling and pushing, pulling, pushing, the pipette method as I call it. If your system is big and you don't have any limit uh, or restrictions about the weight of your system or uh, the size, you can actually put in the mixing chamber a magnetic bar and had add one of those uh, steering plates that you can also control with your potential stat or your uh, or your board right so you can actually tell it when to start mixing when to stop mixing when uh, and everything so this is a very simple option that you can use if you need if you have any limitation or your system is very very small because these uh, types of uh, Strategies are very use, are very good if you're using big volumes. I'm talking about uh, milliliters. If you're into the microliters, then you're going to use what is called the mixing chamber. And what you see here, you have liquid A and liquid B going into this uh, chamber. And then there's the, the, the zigzag, which is basically a very long tube. At, and at the end of it, and you can see this uh, simulation, you, you, you add the red and the blue and they're, at the end, they're well mixed together. So this is one strategy. Now I saw a student that did a simulation about different uh, mixing strategies. She did the COMSOL simulation. So she, she compared just having a long tube and you can see it's not as well mixed as having these zigzags. And she did had an idea for another mixing strategy is that if you change the dimension of the tube, so increase it and decrease it. And what happens is that if you increase the dimension of the tube, you actually, uh, you have a drop in the pressure 
So you have this uh, turbulence behavior, not laminar anymore. And then when you decrease it, you have high pressure and low pressure. And you have, and she did a series of those, and she saw that at the end, it's, you can also have an almost well mix. So you can also tweak that and get, and in this case, you can see she has uh, three inlets. So she tried to mix uh, three different liquids and uh, measure, the, uh, measure the efficiency of that uh, mixing strategy. So those are the things that you, you, you will use. There's not a lot of like game here. Either you're gonna use the Grema style as my old PI used to call it, right? Or you, if you're using small volumes, you'll use something that is a little more advanced. Now, public enemy number one in microfluidics is bubbles. Because if you have a bubble inside your tube, get stuck in your tube, it decreases the dimension of the tube. So again, we just talked about it. You decrease the dimension of the tube. In that place, you'll have higher pressure. And then afterward, you have lower pressure, so you can add turbulence. And uh, if that bubble will get stuck on your reference electrode, blocking your reference electrode, then it, your entire measurement is uh, no more useful. And if that bubble is stuck uh, on your working electrode, for example, then if you're thinking that you're measuring everything with an electrode that is a one millimeter diameter and suddenly your electrode is half a millimeter or lower, then your entire measurement is not useful anymore, right? So when I talked about that I had some issues, uh, I was using electrochemistry and electrochemistry, you're using currents, potential, you can actually create bubbles, right? Uh, so I had a problem sometimes with bubbles entering my system and I used to play, push play, come back two hours later, and I noticed that half of the measurements or something like that were not useful because I had a bubble issue. So you need to make sure you have no bubbles and you need to test your system really well or think about strategies to get rid of bubbles. And I'll show you an idea that I use uh, later on. Okay, so we talked about the pump and now we're going to get to the second component, the electrochemically, electrochemistry flow cell, and that's actually the heart of the measurement. That's the most important part because the pump sometimes will not make a big difference. If you're using a, a pump from company A or B, once you program it and once you check it, you're just going to use it. It's just a tool, right? And your FIA or SIA, it might be something that is already determined by the pump that you have or it's something that is not a big deal. You already decided what you're gonna use and you're gonna run with it, right? And so is mixing tra strategy. But the flow cell, that depends on the type of measurement you, you wanna do. And some flow cells are much better for so, uh, a specific type of measurement and some are not. So we have uh, three types of popular cell. We have a wall jet or jet flow type of cell where the liquid collides with the electrode and then moves on. We have a thin layer or flow by where the liquid actually flows by the electrode. And we have a flow through, which is a membrane or a sponge or a net that the liquid actually flows through your electrodes. And let's discuss each one uh, and see its advantages and disadvantages. So the wall jet. The wall jet is very popular if you're using a disposable screen printed electrode that are actually specifically made for this type of measurement. You can see that the, here is a screen printed electrode, and this is the cell the company sells specifically for this type of electrode. And here, as you already know, you have your working in the middle, you have your uh, reference electrode, and you have your counter electrode surrounding, and the liquid that will hit this electrode actually hits the entire cell. So your, this is your entire electrochemical cell. Uh, and over here, that's an example that I, I, I saw uh, for doing a, a jet, uh, a, a wall jet measurement uh, using a commercial available uh, uh, electrode that are not uh, screen printed. They add their inlet and here, this is actually their uh, counter electrode. It's just a stainless steel tube. So the fluid flows through the stainless steel tube, your counter collides with the working electrode and moves out. And here they add the reference electrode. Now, the issue is that they put the reference electrode in the measurement. So if you have any contamination from the reference electrode, it might affect the measurement. But remember, we talked about bubbles. If you have a bubbles and bubbles tends to go up, that gets stuck here because this is very narrow then your measurement is no longer good. Uh, 
So this is one type of uh, cell. Now, the idea in this cell is that liquid collides with the electrode, the screen printed electrode, and then it's symmetrically uh, dispersed in, in, all the, in all the area. Now, this is in theory, but this is not actually what happens. What happens because you have only one outlet, the liquid is actually drawn to a specific site, it has a preference, and it's not symmetrical, so you're not using the entire area of the electrode correct, uh, and you're actually adding a systematical error. And this is, again, uh, another uh, experiment or simulation that they show that, that the speed is different in different areas. Uh, and again, you're adding a systematical error, but again, it's not a random error. So if you have a systematical error in your measurement, it's something that you can uh, put into your calculation and it will not affect your overall uh, calibration curve and uh, analysis. Uh, another thing is that Again, if you remember, your working electrode is here, so it still will get most of the, the liquid. So again, the systematic error will probably be very small, but it's something that you need to be aware of. Now, here's a, a relatively recent 2016 uh, example of uh, Compton uh, from Oxford, I think, that he used a, a well-jet well -jet, uh, approach uh, with uh, REM. REM is random error of microelectrode. What he did is he took uh, epoxy pack and embedded the carbon fiber in that pack. So he had an array, a random error of microelectrode. Each fiber acts as a microelectrode and they were all connected on the bottom. Now, another thing he did is he placed the reference electrode here on one side, the counter on the other side of the working electrode. So the liquid actually goes here and here after colliding. So basically, you don't have this asymmetrical uh, behavior which we just talked about. So, and the reason he wanted to use a, a well jet a approach is that he did a, a stoichiometric measurement. Basically, it's a colliding measurement. Nanoparticles, in this case, silver nanoparticles, are colliding with the electrode, and each collision gives you, gives him a spike. Uh, and from those spikes, it can actually measure the amount of nanoparticles or the size of nanoparticles. And because he used a well jet approach, he had much more uh, collisions. So his measurements were much more accurate compared to other methods that we will discuss. So although it's better for screen printing electrode, and I told you about the asymmetric uh, pattern, you can still tweak it and you can still use it and it will still give you great results. The other approach, which is very simple and very nice, it's a flow by, and this is by Anwen, uh, again from England, I guess. Uh, so, what he did is he printed or fabricate this cup that is open on the bottom, and this cup has a flow in, flows by its electrode, and flows out. And he placed his reference electrode downstream. We just talked about it. So if there's any contamination, the contamination will go from the reference electrode out and not to the place that we're performing the measurement itself, the working electrode. And what he did is he actually compared different size of the working electrode. And over here, over here, the red is uh, the amount of uh, concentration he, that enters the system, in this case 0.1 millimolar, and when this uh, species react, they turn blue, and you can see here on the electrode, you have like a very small blue, right? So you can see a very small amount of the species actually react. Most of the system is actually red, it's dead volume, it's something that you're just, it's just a waste. If you increase the electrode, so it will be the entire area, but again, increasing the electrode means that you have to pay more for an electrode, especially if it's platinum. Uh, you can see that he has much more blue here, right? Because you increase the active surface area, uh, but you still have dead volume. Uh, based on my experience, if you want to decrease that dead volume, what you need to do is decrease the diameter of the tube. If the tube is very, very small, then you have uh, less dead volume, most of the species will react with the electrode, but you will do increase the pressure, so you'll have to have a better pump. So uh, a syringe pump will not do the work if you have a very small diameter, uh, you'll have to use a turbo pump. Now, another thing it did is it actually measured the effect of the speed of the measurement. And this is a big issue. Uh, this is one of my works. Uh, and again, 
This is a system, it's a flow by. Uh, I used two regular electrodes. Uh, this is, was the working, this was the counter, this was the reference, and this is, uh, was not a good prototype because again, told you, bubbles went in and destroyed uh, my measurement. Later on, I bought one of those uh, flow uh, reference electrode that I, I don't remember if it's ALS or BASI, but uh, they actually screw all the way to the bottom and they actually, they, they confined the area. So there was actually confined by the reference electrode uh, and we had no bubbles issue. Now, I measure the effect of the speed on my uh, efficiency. Now, the faster I flow, more species are flowing through the electrode, right? More moles are actually introduced to the electrode. So the faster I flow, the peak will actually increase. So there is a linear dependency between the flow rate and the peak area or peak height. So if you have a very, if you want to reach low level of detection, uh, low, low level, low limits of detections, you have to flow quite fast. So you'll increase your signal. But on the other end, as I told you, there's a lot of dead volume here because that this tube, this tube was not uh, narrow enough. If I'll flow fast, I actually are using more liquid, but not measuring all of it. And you can see here, the, I'm, this is the liquid that enters. All of this is actually dead volume and only a very low amount uh, is affected uh, exiting. So the faster I flow, the lower my efficiency is. So if efficiency is something that is important to you, again, you're measuring something that is very expensive or hard to get, uh, like a biological sample, then you wanna flow very, very slow. So you won't use, your, uh, use too much of your liquid or, or your sample. But if you're doing an analytical measurement and the only thing that is important for you is level of detection, you want to reach those PPT levels, then you want to flow fast. So this is like a dilemma and something that you need to be aware of. And this is the, the actual sensor that I used. So here we have our electrochemical cell. And the, in this case, this was the counter electrode. The working electrode is, the, is on the bottom. This is our, our micro pump. This is uh, my stock solution. This is the sample. And I actually had a tube that came from the, the sampling of the robot or the vessel to here as well. My mixing cell, remember, mixing cell, remember I, it was just up and down, up and down. And my waste, and here you can see my control unit. That, And here you can see we had a limitation about the size of the sensor. So we had a weight limitation. It, it should, I think it was less than 10 kilos. Uh, uh, and it was supposed to be 40 centimeters, if I'm not mistaken, 40 on 40. And the height was about 82. And we used a very small potency stat. This is Palmsense EM stat potency stat, which is very good and programmable. Uh, and you can see everything is really messy but it it was all inside and we just had these tubes for water out water in we had another uh, a hole for a, a, a power and another hole for uh, information because the engineers of the project that uh, built the robot they didn't care about what happens in this uh, black box or silver box they wanted a box in certain dimension certain weight that will have water in, water out, information and, and power. And we have limitation on the power as well, had limitation on the power. And so when you design a system, you need, to, you need to make sure that everything is covered. So the robot will send a command, measure, you'll measure, and then it will transmit the, uh, the data. But if you have a flow system, everything is programmable and you can make sure that everything runs well. And again, you don't have to touch it. And once your system is uh, runs okay, you can trust it and it will do its job. Uh, just one more note, this was the first prototype uh, and uh, I, I didn't find a picture of the latest prototype, but you can see the system is on the top and here we actually had our uh, processor board and everything on the bottom. Now the problem is that, that every, what, every drop of water leaking from the system actually can uh, circuit, circuit the, the, the processor. So we, we changed that later on, but again, think about it. I was a chemist. I didn't think about all those things. So I made it, it worked, I was happy, and then I realized, oh, 
I need to redo it. Okay, so we talked about uh, uh, jet to, uh, uh, flow and we talked about uh, uh, flow by thin layer. So thin layer is another option which I wanted actually to use in my uh, project, but I couldn't because those these cells that are sold by Bassi are quite heavy, but they are still good. So the idea here is that you have your uh, your uh, you have a gasket that can actually change the pattern of the flow. So you can have a cross, and it's already you, this is the uh, gasket of the cross, and here you can see you have two electrodes, the, those two dots, and it will actually reach one electrode, the other electrode, and perform the measurement. So this is a simple measurement. But let's say you want to measure with a couple of electrodes. So you'll buy one of those blocks that actually have three electrodes. So you'll have an electrode here, an electrode here, and an electrode here maybe. I'm saying three, it could be more. And the pattern actually, because of the gasket, will be in an arc shape or a fan shape. So the liquid actually reaches all the electrodes simultaneously and you can measure with a few electrodes at the same time. You can also have uh, one of those uh, radial measurements. So again, position an electrodes here, 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 and here, for example, and you can measure with several electrodes. And they have a screw reference electrode uh, in and out. It. Those are very, very nice. Uh, they give you flexibility in the pattern. And if you have one of those in the lab, then it's great. You can have great result with it. They're not that expensive. And if you have a machine shop in your institution uh, or the place you work, you can actually design different types of electrodes and uh, gaskets depending on your needs. Now, here's an example by uh, Crooks from uh, Texas. Uh, he did a dual channel flow by uh, measurement. So he had two electrodes. The first electrode here you see very small, he reduces a, a, a species. And then in the second electrode, he actually oxidized this species. Now this electrode could be very, very small because you just need, you just want to apply a certain current and reduce everything. This electrode is a little bigger because you might want to actually have a signal that you can calculate something from. Now, A was his first prototype and B was actually the where he did the measurement. So what he did is he, he, he reduced the oxidized species then the reduced form can actually react with an adsorbed species and forming an oxidized species. And then it actually measures here the amount of a reduced species that are left in the system. So basically by this measurement, it can actually calculate the amount of a absorbed species. So this is an indirect measurement. It's very nice. Now, if you remember how messy my system is, I, and you see this drawing, this is a very, very nice drawing. Everything is very simplified. In real life, things are messy. So this is actually a system. So first he uses a syringe pump and you can see he has two syringes because he wants to mix uh, the liquid. Uh, or you can see his nice purple syringe pump here. And this is his actual system. Look at all the wires and all the things coming out of the system. It's really, really messy. But you need to remember, experimental system are often messy, right? We're trying things, we don't know if it works, we'll change things and then it works and then we don't want to touch it, we want to run it and get all the results. It's the job of a product designer to take our messy job and talking with us and trying to figure out the way that we can actually make a nice system that is user friendly. Because at the end of the day, if you want to make something that will be sold, the user would want something very, very simple, just pushing a button uh, or getting a result, it doesn't want to see all these wires. It doesn't care if, if the system works perfectly. If the system doesn't look nice, it won't touch it. But when you're in the experimental stage, this is fine. And a lot of the flow systems in papers, they look very nice because they add these nice graphical images of them, but in real life, they're messy. So if your system looks like that and you're like, I'm doing something wrong, you're fine. Okay, our last uh, type is the flow through. And Here's an example from one of my old advisors, uh, Professor Mendler from the Hebrew University. Uh, what he did is he created a Bucky paper. A Bucky paper is you take one of those Whitman filter paper and you disperse uh, carbon nanotubes on them. So the advantage of carbon nanotubes is that they have a huge surface area, right? So if you disperse those carbon nanotubes on the, on the, on the paper, and it, they will be randomly, but if your, their concentration of carbon nanotubes is high enough, 
they will be well connected. So you have like a network of carbon nanotubes. You can also buy it commercially, but it's extremely expensive. So it's uh, better to make it your, uh, by yourself if you can. Now, what he did is he pushed the flow from the button through this paper that actually acts as his working electrode. He used the connection. And here you actually see the system. So water are coming from the button here, water are coming from here. This is your counter connection. This is your working connection. Your bucket paper is over here. And this is your reference electrode. Sorry, I have an issue. This is your reference electrode, which is a downstream over here as well, just as we talked about it. So this is one example of a flow through electrode. A, those electrodes are not as uh, well defined as the two others. So basically, if you have any idea, you can try it. It's not like a flow by where basically you can play with the size of the electrode, but basically they all look the same or a, a screen pitted electrode, which all their flow cells will look the same. Now, this is one of my examples, and I, uh, which I actually use a syringe pump. So I told you I love uh, sequential injection analysis, but Sometimes you don't need to use them, just like you saw Crooks and Mandler, they used a syringe pump, and also I used a syringe pump in this case as well. And what I designed is actually a flow path platform. So I saw that Pine has one of those screen printed electrodes that this is, this is their counter, this is their reference, and in the middle you have a honeycomb that has holes that actually uh, serves as the working electrode. Now, I was only interested in this honeycomb uh, as a working electrode or counter electrode. So I designed a system where the, the fluidic will go through the counter electrode, then the working electrode, and then if you want to do pure electrochemistry, this is a modular system, so you can change uh, the units. So, and sorry for that line, you can actually attach unit C1, so it will go from here through unit C1 uh, in a linear form uh, and you have your electrochemical measurement and again the reference is uh, downstream but we wanted to show that we can also do uh, spectral electrochemical measurements so we designed unit uh, C2 unit C2 the fluid will actually go from unit B and now it will go 90 degrees out but here here we have a fiber optic so in that case uh, we have a reaction on the working electrode that emits light, and we can actually measure that light. That's an ECL unit, electrochemical luminescence uh, unit. So we, if you have some kind of uh, electrospectrocouple uh, measurement that you actually emit light, you can use it to, to measure the light. Now, we tried to commercialize this unit, we did at the end, and we were looking for someone that will buy it. And we talked with a few vendors, and they told us, listen, a lot of our customers are doing electrochemistry, but they need a UVVs uh, type of measurement. So we said, sure, no problem. So we designed unit T3, where you can see the fluid will go straight, but in this case, we have one fiber optic uh, for the light source and another one that will go for the detector. In all of them, the reference is downstream. And to show that this unit actually worked, that we took a solution of iron that was uh, almost colorless, and we did the electrochemical reaction that actually changes the redox state of the iron so it becomes blood red and we actually showed that we can measure the absorbance and calculate the concentration of iron and what's nice is because we actually created a color first solution in the working electrode on the tube from the working to the uh, measurement place itself the fiber the spectroscopic measurement we can actually see the liquid going in this nice arrowhead so we need we had a visual proof of our laminar flow so that was uh, nice so this is an example how you can do uh, uh, another type of flow through measurement in this case this was my electrode uh, and again if i have bubbles they will get stuck in one of those small ones but if you flow fast enough the bubbles did not get stuck and they cannot block the reference because the reference was just a wire that uh, sticks into the tube. So if it blocks part of it, it still doesn't damage the measurement. Now, the most uh, common way of fault for measurement is actually not for analytical uses. It's actually to clean water. What they do is they take uh, 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 nets that are made uh, from conductive material and they put a net, put a separator, 
put another net so one net will act as a working a separator a counter and they'll repeat it so you'll have a working separator counter separator working separator counter and so so you can see you have this sandwich of several electrodes and they'll just roll it up like you see here in the picture and you have outlet here and outlet here and the liquid will actually go through all of the layers and you'll apply a constant potential and metals that are in the water will be deposited on the, those nets so you're actually removing heavy metals from the water and later on you will just dis uh, discharge all the metals to uh, a waste solution so it's still a flow through it's still an electrochemical flow cell it's just not for analytical use it's for cleaning water but it might give you an idea and i thought it's something that you need to be aware of now all the systems i talked about were quite large they're either microliters or uh, uh, sorry milliliters or microliters but like i'm talking hundreds of microliters uh, if you want to use only a few uh, microliters i'm talking about one to to ten microliters you have to go into nanofluidics now everything i talked about for the bigger systems also apply for nanofluidics or microfluidics and this is an example of a flow through so or first this is a screen printing electrode again same idea it's just smaller so you can still use a jet flow just make sure all the tubes are smaller this is a flow by so you can see just like uh, we saw I uh, it was uh, Anwin I think just like Anwin did it flows flows by the electrode and then you have uh, your outlet with the reference uh, and same thing the only thing is the dimensions are uh, much smaller but everything all the things we talked about all the things you need to think about apply here you might have more limitations because of the size but on the other hand because you're using advanced technologies to to fabricate th these machines right uh, you're using laser cutting etc uh, you have more flexibility in the design of the system so uh, those two things actually work out as a plus minus that uh, at the end of the day you can still smile and be happy now here's another type of one of those systems so here we have a uh, nine sensors so we have three lines each line has three electrodes one two three and you can see here are our electrodes now we don't want to expose all this wire right we just want to expose the, the tips the electrode so the first layer this layer will be the the layer that you see here with the you have all the print in the electrode and i told you it gives you more flexibility because it's easier to design the the spread of your electrode in your system and everything the second layer so you have we have this layer of the electrode the second layer will actually be uh, the channels so you have an a layer that is actually open but it will define the channels but it, it will be open in places like where you have your sensors so let's say we had three sensors right so it's opened in this place so by sandwiching it we're actually uh, having our connections to the electrode in these holes right but this layer might be open on the top it's not well defined so you'll add another layer that's the uh, another layer uh, sorry for that another layer that will actually confine that and close that so at the end of the day your system is well well confined and the holes are only where you want to have uh, the liquid see the electrodes or see uh, another area so this is the sandwich approach but again all the concepts we talked about how do you want to design your system how where do you want to place your reference how do you want the fluid to go mixing all works out here as well lab on chip just the same thing right you have your uh, i wanted to show here so you have all your sections uh, you have your uh, mixing chamber here right so you need to have a mixing chamber you can design it uh, in in uh, in a sandwich form uh, and i think this one is in a sandwich form because you see you have uh, the bottom layer and the top layer which is this one which is a little thicker that sits on top of all the printed circuit uh so just like we talked about you have different types of electrodes so they have ph electrodes uh, they had the a glucose lactate i think it's a reservoir but they also measure the glucose lactate and urea and ammonia you can have more electrode 
your system could be much more efficient, much more so, uh, sim, uh, so not simple, much more efficient, will have much more ability. It won't be simple because you need to think about more things in advance. And you know, when you're going down to smaller sizes, uh, everything is much more complex, right? Because it's hard to touch things, it's hard to see things. But the basic principle of microfluidics and electrochemical flow systems uh, are the same. Now, testing your system. So you already designed your system, you know everything works, you want to test your system because you want to be able to press that play button, go home to sleep, come back the next morning and have like a, a ton of data to do analysis on, right? That's the dream. Or you want to know that your system can work without someone supervising it. So there's two types of tests. The first test is an electrochemical test. So these are the tests that I did with my systems. Uh, what I did here is I just changed the flow rate, uh, sorry, the scan rate, and measured the, the CV. I think uh, in this case it was a, a ferrets and methanol solution. And you want to see that your uh, P current uh, is linear with the root of the root of the scan rate, right? What you see here. And in this case, you can see the, both the anodic and cathodic uh, peaks are linear with the root of the scan rate and you can also calculate the slope to be sure so your system acts like it's supposed to act so you're happy uh, the second thing i did is an analytical measurement so i added different concentration in this case it's a uh, exatiano for uh, and what i did is i did three measurements or four for each concentration so I can have like also statistical data. So you can see the error bars and you can see that in one, two, three, it's quite reproducible also in four. In four and five, the line is a little wobbly, right? And that's because we had issue with the pump. I told you, you have to make sure the pump doesn't add noise to your measurement. In this case, the Friday cage of the pump was not sealed well enough. So it added some noise to our measurement. But you can still see that the error bars in, in five that looks really bad. They're not that bad, actually. It still gives you a linear behavior. And those are small fluctuation. It just doesn't look really well. Uh, so we can see that analytical wise, the system also behaves well. So two simple electrochemical tests that you can do. Uh, I will always do the first one, the second one only if I want to use the system for analytical purposes. Now, sometimes you have a cell specific measurement. So this is a cell that, uh, this is a cell that uh, I designed for UMEs, uh, ultra microelectrode. I want to design a, a cell that can use, uh, can use UME and can use UME as an array. So I added four working electrodes and four counter electrodes and you can see it's working, counter, working, counter, working, counter, working, counter, because I wanted to have them symmetrical. I didn't want to have all the working on one side and all the counter on the other. Uh, so they're dispersed sy symmetrically in the flow cell. And another advantage of uh, doing this type of cell is that if you look up from the cell, then you have the electrode sticking in, right? But the flow will go from the bottom to the top. So if you have any bubbles, the bubbles will actually flow in the middle or in the side, but they will maybe they will get attached to the side, right? They do like it to get attached to materials, but they will not block the electrodes. So that's one one strategy to get rid of the electrodes. Now, what I want to see here is that if I'm measuring with one electrode and then I'm adding another electrode, the signal doubles, and another electrode, each electrode will increase the signal by the same amount. So I did the same type of measurement. I added electrodes so you can see one two three four electrodes and i this is a uh, and you can see that the we are the absolute uh, signal increases with the uh, amount of the electrode in a linear way so we knew that our system actually works nicely uh, what you do need to think about it is that let's say all your working electrode is a 10 micron uh, platinum electrode if your counter is also a 10 pla uh, micron platinum electrode, then the size of your counter and working are pretty much the same. So in this case, you might think about using a 25 micron as a counter, right? Just to have a better uh, decrease any problems in your system. Uh, 
And again, I'm just saying it because you need to always to remember that your counter has to be the same size or bigger, and it's, uh, you would prefer that it would, will be bigger than you're working. So that was one mistake that I did in the first protocol that I actually uh, improved by just changing the counter uh, size. Okay, so hydro hydrodynamic tests. So all the tests that I showed you are electrochemical tests, but we do need to remember that we also added flow to our system, right? So we need to check how the system behaves from a dynamic point of view. So you can have simulations and that, to back up your uh, experimental data, but you need to have those experimental data. So one thing that uh, you can see and, uh, is that the shape of the, the, I'm changing here the flow rate from 0.1 uh, milliliter uh, per second to two milliliter per second. And you can see that with the, the flow rate, I'm not only increasing uh, my signal, which you can see here, but the shape of the voltammogram starts to look like a steady state voltammogram, right? It's, it, you don't get, uh, you don't get the, this nice uh, peaks that are, uh, I'm sorry for my drawing abilities, you don't get this nice peak like you see in the, in the black, in the low, low speed, because when you increase the flow rate, you actually decrease the dependency of the diffusion. Because when you flow in very, very slow, or not at all, the peak will only be dependent on uh, diffusion. But once we increase the convection, at a certain point, diffusion doesn't play a role anymore. And we're always almost uh, approaching a steady state uh, kind of a uh, current. So you can see that this actually changes. And I didn't show you that in the previous slide when I did the uh, uh, analytical performance of the flow system. Uh, but if you go back and look at it, you'll see that the, I, I, the flow rate was quite fast, so all the curves actually look like a steady state curve because there were not that diffusion control. Now, another thing that you need to look is this peak. This peak is actually getting smaller. Uh, and what happens in our system is that when usually when you're doing an electrochemical measurement, let's say you're oxidizing uh, this species, you're oxidizing this species, this species will be in the diffusion layer or around the electrode, and when you, if it's a reversal process and you're going to reduce this species back, the peak should be on the same size, right? Now, now I'm actually introducing flow. So everything that is oxidized are being pushed away from the electrode. So the faster I flow, I have less oxidized species in the, near the electrode and the peak will actually get smaller. So that's actually another indication that our system works well. Now, if you see here, I, I, I did a correlation between the peak and the cubic root of the flow rate. And the reason I did that is that there's a paper by uh, Compton and Anwin together uh, about 20 years ago that they showed that if you're using a tubular electrode, and in this case, I, I use the honeycomb, which is tubular, uh, the dependency should be uh, the cubic root of the flow rate. Now, lastly, you would want to measure the efficiency of your system, if that's something that is important to you, and it, usually it is. So if you have experimental data, if you have a peak, then if you know the amount of moles and you know the concentration and your flow rate, you can actually calculate the charge and uh, you know what's the theoretical charge that you expect from the amount of a, a amount of moles that you introduce to the system in the concentration and you know what's the charge that you actually calculated because the charge actually you can integrate the area of the peak and a lot of the software will actually do it automatically or, or you can tell them integrate between uh, this potential to that potential uh, so by comparing these two charges you can actually calculate your efficiency i did also a simulation so i knew the flux in and I knew the flux out, and calculating the flux into the flux out, I can actually uh, calculate the efficiency of my system. Now, if I'll summarize everything that we talked about. So first, you need to choose your pump, and you'll choose your pump based on the method you wanna use, right? So if you wanna use FIA, uh, flow injection analysis, a syringe pump, a parasitic pump are good enough. You don't have to pay too much for a pump, and again, all the pump, you can buy like a, a basic version of, of them or a version that you can actually connect to a computer or a potentiostat and control them. 
Uh, if you're using sequential injection analysis, you might want to invest in a more advanced pump. And if you're using very small uh, amount of liquid, and I'm talking about uh, tens of microliters or, uh, or less, you're gonna probably use a turbo pump. The second thing is what type of cell that your system is re required. Do you do a jet flow? Do you wanna use the disposable electrodes, for example? Uh, do you want to do a flow by a thin cell? Let's say you want to be able to change the flow pattern at one point, or you want a very simple system, uh, or it's a flow through. And the advantage of a flow through, and I don't think I said it so far, is that because the liquid flows through the electrode, you decrease the amount of dead volume. You actually increase your surface uh, tremendously, just like uh, Professor Mendel did with the carbon nanotubes. So you have a you have a better signal usually. So those systems are much more efficient, but they're harder to design. Just think about it. If you have a sponge, let's say you have like this uh, uh, carbon sponge that you can buy commercially. How do you actually connect it uh, to your potentiostat without uh, having a hole in your system? So you have to design a holder for that, uh, for that electrode, right? So they're more complicated, but they're much better. Cover all the bases. Make sure that there's no bubble traps on the electrode. You can make bubble traps in the system itself. Uh, make sure that everything is the way it reacts. For example, in our system, in the platform one that I showed you, the spectroscopical platform, electrospectroscopical platform, we had a counter working and then reference. Most people told us, why didn't you have like a working counter and then a reference? Because everything that is reacting on the counter might affect your working. Well, we did try that and we had a lot of like electrical no uh, interferences, noises. So try different scenarios and see what fits you best, right? And then check your system electrochemically, hydrodynamically. If you have something specific, check all of that. Now, if you have any question at all, you can contact me. My name is Tomer Neuhauser, as I said, and my email is tomer.neuhauser. You can find my name in every site, tomer.neuhauser at gmail.com. So feel free to send me any question you might have. Now, I hope I was able to convince you that flow cells are awesome and you must have one. I do believe that the future for online monitoring and remote sensing, because they're much more sensitive and much more reliable and inexpensive compared to spectroscopical uh, systems that are uh, vastly used. Now, the last thing I forgot to say is this uh, presentation was first given as part of the ECS, Electrochemical Society Montreal student chapter. They did a, a, a microfluidic workshop it was uh, done by me and uh, Dr. Samuel Perry that talked about the simulation aspect of microfluidics and how do you approach it from a simulation point of view. So if you are doing a simulation of microfluidics or flow systems and you're stuck or you have a question, feel free to send me an email. Again, uh, tomer.neuhauser at gmail.com. Send me an email and I'll make sure to contact you with uh, Dr. Perry uh, uh, so he can answer your question. He's a very nice guy. And again, I hope I convinced you that flow systems are awesome and good luck with your work.